Welcome again to our study, our concluding session. We're going to look at uh, chapters 21 and 22, which are the last chapters in the book of Revelation. Here, we see that after the thousand-year reign of Christ upon earth, the heavens, the earth, are dissolved, and we are told that there's a new heaven and a new earth. So everything is new. This is what the Apostle Peter said, that he looked for an earth, a heaven and earth, where dwelleth righteousness. This will be in the new heaven and the new earth after the millennial reign of Christ. Now, as we look at uh, these two chapters, we're introduced, of course, to the river of life, flowing from the New Jerusalem and flowing from the New Jerusalem and we are indeed instructed into some of the mysteries of this New Jerusalem. I would like to look with you at this and uh, notice some of the features concerning that heavenly city that I hope that we will all be able to enjoy and which we will do so if we follow the instructions of the book of Revelation. Now, first of all, it makes a clear-cut demarcation between those who are in and those who are out. It says concerning those that overcome, and we've spoken a lot about overcoming, haven't we? Overcoming this world, the lust of the flesh, and the lusts of the eyes, overcoming those things, the flesh, the world, the devil. And here we are told that in verse 8, those that are fearful, those that are unbelieving, those that do abominable things, murderers, whoremongers, and the such like, are in outer darkness. Now, I want to say this, that those that are fearful, you know, many cannot go forward in the Christian life because of fear. We have to overcome fear. And we're told that perfect love casts it out, fear. If you love someone, you do not fear. And so, in a very real sense, we need to be perfected in love so that all fear is cast out. And with confidence, we can put our hand in the hand of the man of Galilee, as King George VI was oft quoted in his uh, wartime messages to the people of England. And I'd like to invite you to put your hand into the hand of the man of Galilee as Christ walks us through these truths of the book of Revelation. Now, as I've said we now come to what is called the Bride of Christ, the Lamb's Wife, and uh, is likened unto the city, the New Jerusalem. There are many things concerning this city that I'd like to comment on. First of all, I would say this, that there are twelve foundations, the twelve foundations of the Holy Apostles, and also there are twelve gates. Now, These twelve gates are very important because they are gates of pearl and I want to comment on this thought of pearl. The symbol of pearl, pearl rather, is a symbol of suffering. And I was once asked when I was at a college uh, church, but uh, where do pearls come from? Well, they come from oysters. And uh, then the next question was, well, do all oysters have pearls? And the answer is no. And then the next question from these students was this, why does one oyster have a pearl and another oyster not? And so at that time I had to say, well, I don't know. And it was about 11 o'clock at night and I wanted to get away. But no, they were very persistent. And they said, well, we have a professor who's a marine biologist, he'll know. And I said, you're going to call him at 11 o'clock at night. 
And they said, oh yes, he'd be thrilled that anybody would be that interested in calling him or asking his opinion. So they did. And here is the interesting answer that this marine biologist gave at this certain university. He said this. He said the oyster basically remains at the bottom of the sea. It opens to receive food and then closes again. But he said, those oysters that want to move on, they wiggle. And then when they open their mouth, they let a foreign piece of substance that they have stirred up at the bottom enter their, um, shall I say, stomach, and then there proceeds a healing process whereby a fluid from their stomach coats this piece of foreign substance and it forms a pearl. Well then the Lord started to speak to me. You know, some Christians have an easy life. Some people have a very easy life because they're not pressing on. It's those who press on, who learn the sufferings of Christ, are made conformable unto his image. Well, to enter... One of these twelve gates we have to qualify because the Apostle Paul says if we suffer with him we shall also reign with him. And it is those that are pressing on who are seeking to go on in the Christian life who experience also the rejections and the sufferings that that entails. Then there's another thought. These twelve gates you see, have angels there with the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. There is a thought that I'd like to leave with you. For well, therefore, which gate would we enter? We'd enter by the gate of our tribe. And it is something that is very rewarding when the Lord reveals to us our spiritual tribe. I just want to leave that with you. For those of you who are keen on the deeper things of the Word of God. And then, of course, this wonderful, wonderful city is filled with the glory and light of God. And also, you know, there's such a, a beautiful sense of purity there. And I want to say this. Blessed are the pure for they shall see God. And we want to cry out to God, even as King David did after his adulterous affair with Bathsheba. He cried out in Psalm 51, O oh Lord, create in me a clean heart. And we want to constantly cry out, Lord, cleanse me, purify me. Create in me a clean heart. Because it is the pure in heart, they shall see God. And here, the very light of the city is the very presence of God. And to enter those gates, we have to experience his suffering, but also we have to have a pure heart. That is possible when the Lord hearkens to our cry and does indeed create a pure heart within us. Now then, moving on from those few thoughts we come now to the fact in verse 23 the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it and the kings of them kings of the earth do indeed bring their glory and honor into it it's like to touch on the fact it says the nations of them which are saved it's something that is often forgotten but at the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ the nations shall come before him and he will divide them as a shepherd does dividing the sheep from the goats and what is the definition of a goat nation well it is one that does not care for their wounded who does not care for the poor who does not care for those in difficulties. Whereas the sheep nations 
of those that look after the poor, hold out their hands and give to those in need and help those in prison as well as those who are sick. As I have travelled throughout the world, it becomes abundantly clear who are the sheep nations and who are the goat nations. And uh, I simply want to say this, that we are enjoined to pray for those in authority, that we might have a peaceable life, but also to pray for your country, that your country might indeed be one of the countries that enter in to the new heaven and the new earth, a country that has been deemed by God to be a sheep nation, and a nation that turns to God and has the laws of God firmly in their constitution. You know, so often today, the rules are changed, the laws are changed. To admit, to, and if I could say this, almost authenticate sin in the lives of people. Why? Because sin abounds everywhere and the standards are being lowered by those in authority who should indeed guard them. Well, we want to pray for those in authority that they will indeed be a father to the nation and that they indeed will remember the scripture which says, Righteousness exhorteth a nation. Sin is a degradation to any people. So we want to pray for our own nations, don't we? So that they will indeed be amongst the righteous nations who will enter into the new heaven and the new earth and have right of access into the new Jerusalem. Well, so much then for chapter 20 and remembering the great divide between the fearful, the unbelieving, the adulterer and the like, the murderer, on the outside, and the pure in heart on the inside. And don't forget, King David prayed, created me a clean heart. It wasn't because David's heart was pure, it was far from it. He cried out to God that God would create in him a clean heart. What David prayed, we can pray. What David received, we can receive. And so we might have access into the new heavens and the new earth. Now then, we are looking at chapter 22. And in chapter 22, we are told that there's a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and out of the Lamb. In the book of Ezekiel, the prophet saw from the church a river flowing. And that river got deeper and deeper as it went on. And everywhere that that river flowed, there was life and there was healing. Now, although this river, of course, is in the new heavens and new earth, there is a river of life flowing out from the throne of God now. And as we touch it by faith, we can receive healing and we can receive life. This particular river, which flows during the new heavens and the new earth, we find that in the midst of the street of it, on either side of the river, are tree of life, which bring forth twelve manner of fruits and They yield their fruit every month and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Well, fruit. Don't we want to be trees of righteousness bringing forth fruit? I think it's so important that as we look at the book of Revelation we apply it to our own lives. That we apply it to ourselves living in the church age and realize that what we're reading here is also a reality for us too that we want to draw near to that river of life 
And don't forget, the Lord Jesus Christ said this. He said, you know, he that hungereth and thirsteth, let him come unto me, and out of his inmost being shall flow rivers of living water. And from our churches, we want those rivers of living water flowing out to our community, so that by the grace of God, they might receive the life of Christ, and they also might receive healing too. Well, as we go on in this scripture, we find that indeed that there are many wonderful things spoken of concerning the new heaven and new earth. But coming down to the practical application for us, we find in verse 7, he says, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Now, the thought is this. What are those sayings of prophecy of this book? Well, in reality, it is very clear indeed that we are to keep the commandments of Jesus and that we are to live a holy and godly life. And I think when we read the book of Revelation, and we find that indeed, as the Apostle Paul also says in Ephesians, that we are seated together with him in heavenly places, that in the ages to come, he will show unto us the exceeding riches of his grace. You know, here on earth, we are being prepared for heaven. We are getting glimpses of heaven in the book of Revelation. And one of the things I think that we should understand from this book is this, that as we live here, so we shall live, not only throughout the thousand years of Christ's reign upon earth, but for all eternity. And when we enter into the new heaven and new earth, our place, our position, our ministry, will have been dependent on how we have lived here. And so, I think one of the things that is so important about this book, it gives us a feeling of eternity whilst we're living here upon earth. And it encourages us to think of eternal things rather than those things that will disappear so very quickly around us. Our life is very short. Moses said, 70 years. But if by reason of strength we are given 80 years, it is still very fleeting indeed. King Hezekiah said, it's like a weaver's shuttle. It goes like that. It's over and done with. Well, we're like the grass of the sea, of the earth. We come up and in the morning and at night we disappear. Well, that being so, shouldn't we think more as we look at the book of Revelation on the fact of the eternal things that are spoken of in this book? And I want to continue with this, and it's a very solemn thought here. But in verse 11, it says this, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. In other words, there comes a time when we cross over the line and it's a point of no return. And God is simply saying, well, make your choice. And according to that choice, stay there. And I I have said this often to audiences, congregations around the world, that there is a principle in God that as we put our feet in a path and walk in that path, eventually we are, if I could say this, placed in concrete, and we can't move. You know, in the positive sense, Ezekiel says that God will cause us to walk in his ways. In other words, if we turn, and God says this, that if we draw nigh to him, he will draw nigh to us, that if we put our uh, feet in the pathway of righteousness, sooner or later we should be so consumed with a hunger and thirst for righteousness that we should be filled with the righteousness of God. On the other side, you know, Pharaoh, Pharaoh, at the time of Moses, hardened his heart 
ten times, and then it's a point of no return. God hardened his heart ten times and eventually slew him. I want to come back to the positive because my purpose is to preach to those who are going to heaven and to those of you who are amenable to going to heaven. I want to encourage every one of you to walk in the pathway of righteousness. But you see this, that as we walk in that way, not only do we have a hunger and thirst for God's righteousness and are filled with his righteousness, but there's a sense of holiness here. And holiness is basically this. It is a separation from that which is evil and a joining to God who is alone holy. And God is a holy God and he wants his people to be holy, separate from sin and joined to him. And so here is a thought, you see, that after righteousness we go on to holiness. All right. And then again this thought of I come quickly. You know, Peter said, well, the scoffers say, well, where is the fulfillment of his promise? Now, beloved, this sort of I come quickly can also apply to our own individual life. You know, there's a time to be born, there's a time to die. One of the parables of the Lord Jesus Christ was concerning the man who amassed, you know, all this wealth, and he said, I have to build bigger barns. And you know, what did the Lord say, thou fool? This night is thy soul required of thee. You know, I've known many people who say, oh yes, but I've got plenty of time. I'll wait. I'll wait until I'm nearing death, and then I'll turn to the Lord. You know, many have been mistaken in that area. And I recall one particular church service where the pastor absolutely pleaded with the young people and said, tonight is the night of salvation. And he went up to one man, one young fellow, as he was sitting there, put his hand upon him and said, please, please give your heart to the Lord. And the young man said, well, next week, Pastor, but please tonight. He refused. He went out. The pastor, you know, was occupied by other people. And about half an hour later, there was a commotion at the door. And young men came running into the pastor and they said, do you remember Peter? That you asked him to give his heart tonight to the Lord? The pastor said, yes. He said he's just been killed in the street. He didn't look in crossing the street and he was struck down. Oh, I want to say this. You know, I come quickly. Well, yes, in a certain sense, when his timing comes, he'll come like a flash of lightning, he said. But uh, it can also be for our own lives. And then he said, you know, I come to give every man according to his work. Well, why not on this earth? You know, in the light of the book of Revelation, the light of eternity, this life so short, a thousand year reign upon, of Christ upon earth, after all the judgments that fall upon this earth, and then the new heaven and new earth, you know, surely this life is so short that we should apply ourselves to that which is going to be eternal. And he said, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. You know, what God has begun, he will finish. And he began in the book of Genesis, he finishes in the book of Revelation. His plan and purpose shall be fulfilled. But the Apostle Paul says this, he said, he that hath begun a good work in you shall finish it until the day of Jesus Christ. And if you will let the Lord start a new work in you, he will finish it. And you will be presented faultless before the throne of God with great joy, as Jude 24 says. Well, again, we have the last blessedness here, and it says, blessed are they that do his commandments that they have, may have right to the tree of life and shall enter in through the gates of the city. Well, there again, you see. The commandments, well, what are the commandments? We know the commandments, the Ten Commandments, don't we? We know what is right and wrong. And those who do right, who determine to do right, you know, they will have the privilege of entering for all eternity into the joys of heaven. And I want to tell you this, that I have been privileged 
to have visions of heaven, experience heaven. And I would tell you this, if you want me to describe heaven, in just briefly, in a few words, I said it's a place of peace and great joy. No sorrow. And everywhere there are pleasures, pleasures galore. For all those who have lived the life here below in the light of the presence of God. And so, he goes on to say, you know, I have given my angel to testify of these things. And he said, I am the offspring of David. Christ, of course, is the son of David, the greater son of David. He is the morning star. He is the bright and morning star. He is the one that would guide us throughout all life. Oh, beloved, you know, thinking again of this wonderful, wonderful book. And when I say the wonderful book, not only the book of Revelation, but from Genesis to Revelation, the whole of God's plan and purpose for man is unfolded that he might indeed offer to man his so great salvation that when we accept, he will so work in us and cause us to be filled with his righteousness, holy in his presence, so that when our time comes to meet him face to face, we shall see that beautiful smile that he has, those beautiful eyes, and we hear those words, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. That is my wish. That is the wish of God, the Father, for each and every one of us. And I just want to encourage you as we come to the end of the book of Revelation. Oh, think of eternity. Think of the joys that this book speaks of and the wonderful rewards for those who listen and will put their feet into the pathway of life by first accepting Christ as their Saviour and then walking with him, led of the Spirit and going whithersoever he leadeth you, always saying yes to him and always receiving grace to triumph in every situation so that you indeed become more than conquerors in Christ who so loves you. God bless you.